Hello, my name is Steve Lampiris. Thank you for watching Greater Than Gold. As some of our regular viewers might remember, we've been doing an extensive series on refuting evolution. In the series, we have proven evolution to be an impossible, absurd, stupid, scientifically baseless, and wicked theory. Most importantly, and infinitely so, we have, by God's grace, shown all viewers where the truth is found, the Holy Bible. In so doing, we have raised the ire of a whole assortment of evolutionists, atheists, progressives, and pagans. Please view our YouTube account at Greater Than Gold to see what I mean. You might want to check out one or more of our programs or perhaps even get involved in the debate in the comments section. By the way, if you would like to order a DVD copy of this program or any of our programs, do not hesitate to call us in God we trust prod Dot com. We will, the good Lord willing, send you out one or more programs on DVD, free of charge and postage paid. Many have done so for their Bible study, Sunday school class, for their family or personal study. As we analyze education, we will turn a bit away from the Refuting Evolution series to return again, the good Lord willing, to finish the last three programs in the Plan 21 part series. We all in this room I know, and we know many millions more everywhere, turn to God in prayer, believe in the power and the spirit of prayer, and yet so often we direct our prayers to those problems that are immediate to us, knowing that he has promised his help to us when we turn to him. And yet in a world today that is so torn with strife, where the divisions seem to be increasing, and not not people coming together, within countries, divisions within the people themselves. And all. I wonder if we have ever thought about the greatest tool that we have, that power of prayer and God's help. If you could add together the power of prayer of the people just in this room, what would be its megatonnage? And have we maybe been, been neglecting this? and not thinking in terms of a broader basis in which we pray to be forgiven for the animus we feel towards someone in perhaps a legitimate dispute, and at the same time recognize that while the dispute will go on, we have to realize that that other individual is a child of God even as we are and is beloved by God as we like to feel that we are. There this power of prayer can be illustrated by a story that goes back to the fourth century. The um, Asian monk living in a little remote village, spending most of his time in prayer or tending the garden from which he obtained his sustenance. I hesitate to, to say the name because I'm not sure I know the pronunciation, but let me take a chance. It was Timelichus back in the fourth century. And then one day, he thought he heard the voice of God telling him to go to Rome. And believing that he had heard, he set out. And weeks and weeks later, he arrived there, having traveled most of the way on foot. And it was at a time of a festival in Rome. They were celebrating a triumph over the Goths. And he followed a crowd into the Colosseum. And then there in the midst of this great crowd, he saw the gladiators come forth stand before the emperor and say, we who are about to die salute you. And he realized they were going to fight to the death for the entertainment of the crowd. And he cried out, in the name of Christ, stop. And his voice was lost in the tumult there in the great Colosseum. And as the games began, he made his way down through the crowd and climbed over the wall and dropped to the floor of the arena. And suddenly the crowd saw this scrawny little figure making his way out to the gladiators and saying over and over again in the name of Christ, stop. And they thought it was part of the entertainment and at first they were amused. But then when they realized it wasn't, they grew belligerent and angry. 
And as he was pleading with the gladiators in the name of Christ, stop, one of them plunged his sword into his body. And as he fell to the sand of the arena in death, his last words were, in the name of Christ, stop. And suddenly a strange thing happened. The gladiators stood looking at this tiny form lying in the sand. A silence fell over the Colosseum. And then someplace up in the upper tiers, an individual made his way to an exit and left. And others began to follow. And in the dead silence, everyone left the Colosseum. That was the last battle to the death between gladiators in the Roman Colosseum. Never again did anyone kill or did men kill each other for the entertainment of the crowd. One tiny voice that could hardly be heard above the tumult, in the name of Christ, stop. It is something we could be saying to each other throughout the world today. Now, several days ago, while I was very concerned about what I was going to say here today and trying to think of something to say, I received through diplomatic channels a message from far out across the Pacific. Some time ago, our ambassador presented to General Romulo of the Philippines the American Medal of Freedom. Not only had he been a great friend of the United States in our time of war, but then he had spent 17 years as an ambassador here in Washington from his country to ours. And for whatever reason, he sent this message of thanks to me for the medal that had been given, and then included the farewell statement that he had made when he left Washington, left this country, after those 17 years. And I had to confess I had never been aware that there had been such a farewell message. And I'm quite sure that many of you hadn't. And so I'm going to share it with you. I think it fits what we're talking about today. He said, I am going home, America. For 17 years, I have enjoyed your hospitality, visited every one of your 50 states. I can say I know you well. I admire and love America. It is my second home. What I have to say now in parting is both tribute and warning. Never forget, Americans, that yours is a spiritual country. Yes, I know you're a practical people. Like others, I've marveled at your factories, your skyscrapers, and your arsenals. But underlying everything else is the fact that America began as a God-loving, God-fearing, God-worshipping people, knowing that there is a spark of the divine in each one of us. It is this respect for the dignity of the human spirit which keeps America invincible. May you always endure. And as I say again in parting, thank you, America, and farewell. May God keep you always, and may you always keep God. Thank you. According to syndicated columnist Linda Bowles, here's a short documented list of the politically prescribed standards taught in public school. It's lesson number one. God is not to be spoken of. Lesson two, rewards should be based on need, not performance. Three, the Alamo was a great Mexican victory. Lesson four, society, and I might add guns, are responsible for crime rather than the criminal. Five, saving the sucker fish is more important than saving the farmers. Six, a diversity of cultures and languages is America's strength. Lesson seven, Thomas Jefferson was a racist. Lesson eight, two plus two equals whatever. Lesson nine, the Boy Scouts were a hate group. 
before they caved in to homosexual militants who are really the hate group. Lesson 10, defending yourself promotes violence. Lesson 11, high taxes are good for America. Lesson 12, the Catholic Church is a hate group. Lesson 13, equality is more important than excellence. Lesson 14, Southern Baptists are a hate group. Lesson 15, carbon dioxide is poisoning the world, and I might add making the climate warm. Lesson 16, cops hate black people. Lesson 17, the Salvation Army is a hate group. Lesson 18, the Constitution is obsolete, but I might add the Emancipation Proclamation is not. along with an education system that dumbs down, indoctrinates, and attempts to produce an immoral citizenry that will not and cannot resist tyranny. An elementary school in North Carolina ordered a little six-year-old girl to remove the name of God from a poem that she had written to honor her two grandfathers that had served in the Vietnam War. Two. The Ohio State House banned Christian pastors from using the name of Jesus when they open up the daily sessions with prayer. Three, the use of the name of Jesus was also forbidden in all prayers, opening sessions of the North Carolina State House. Four, a federal appeals court ruled that prayers before commission meetings in Forsyth County, North Carolina, that included the name of Jesus, were unconstitutional. Five, a student at Sonoma State University was ordered to take off a cross that she was wearing because someone could be offended. Six, a teacher in New Jersey was fired for giving his own Bible to a student that did not own one. Seven, an open-air preacher in Illinois was recently threatened with arrest for, quote, scaring people with the message of the gospel. Eight, a high school track team was disqualified earlier this year because one of the runners made a gesture thanking God once he had crossed the finish line. Nine, volunteer chaplains from Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department have been banned from using the name of Jesus in their public prayers. Sadly, this is not an isolated incident. Chaplains all over the nation are now being banned from using the name of Jesus. 10. A federal judge threatened incarceration to a high school valedictorian unless she removed references to the name of Jesus from her graduation speech. Hence, students are not taught to love serve, follow, and worship God with all of their heart, mind, soul, and being, but are taught to oppose His holy word and His perfect will. They are not taught to love their neighbors as themselves, as the Holy Bible commands, but to inform on them and use them. Evil abounds, death abounds, darkness abounds. Educators, therefore, certainly do not want to mention the hundreds of men and events of the founding era. They should be remembered in history because these men who pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor to establish and did establish by God's grace a country dedicated to God. Their slogan, no king, but King Jesus. To summarize the meaning of Goals 2000, no child left behind in any curriculum forwarded by the National Education Association, listen carefully to the words of a professor from Harvard University, Mr. Chester Pierce, who represents the federal government's education establishment that many parents trust to teach their children. Quote, every child in America entering school at the age of five is insane. It's up to you teachers to make all of these sick children well by creating the international child of the future, unquote. Compare Mr. Pierce's words with the words of communists when Lenin's Bolsheviks used the government school system to seize control of Russian children. Quote, we must remove the children from the crude influence of their families, 
from the first days of their lives, they will be under the healthy influence of communist children's nurseries and schools, unquote. Never forget, atheistic evil communism was and is responsible for over 100 million murders of its own citizens in times of peace. The Christian faith, the family, and even the future of our nation are under attack today as never before. There's now a slide towards socialism and even communism. There's a movement against the Christian faith. There's a corrosion of freedoms previously unheard of in the United States. There is a disdain for human life manifested in a new health care law that would not only kill unborn babies, but very likely lead to the deaths among the elderly and the ill. And there is a depth of immorality and perversion beyond understanding. French historian Alexis de Tocqueville visited the United States in the 19th century and gave what is considered the best analysis of America ever written. Quote, I sought for the key to the greatness and genius of America in her harbors, in her fertile fields and boundless forests, in her rich mines and vast world commerce, in her public school system and institutions of learning. I sought for it in her democratic congress and in her matchless constitution. Not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpits flame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and power. America is great because America is good, and if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. In 2013, it is prudent to note that the current U.S. President Obama has introduced an education policy, much like the communist, anti-Christian, atheist Lenin that would provide a daycare center for every public school in America for the purpose of caring for babies that are not killed by abortion from birth to first grade. Another education agenda that should be tirelessly and very seriously watched is called Common Core, where Mr. Obama is calling for not only public schools, but all Christian, parochial, private, and even home schools to teach the same curriculums as the public schools. In other words, the Holy Bible and Christianity are not allowed to be taught anywhere. Does the education Mr. Obama and what he's peddling revolve around the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic? Not according to columnist George Will, the three R's today mean racism, reproduction rights and recycling. He is so right. May I add, this is part of the new idolatrous religion. Mr. O is peddling. Logically, two questions then arise in our minds. First, just who is in control of education today in the United States of America? Why the government, of course. Why the NEA, of course. Why those who control the money and buy what they want, the Federal Reserve, of course. Whoever they may be individually, the Holy Bible states, ye shall know them by their fruit. The fruit of American and tragically worldwide education is rotten to its core. The Word of God, Ephesians 6. 10 through 13. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. And second, what exactly is genuine education? Genuine education includes the real three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. But it's more. It's also knowledge. It's instruction. It's understanding. It's learning to reason and to think for oneself. And most important, genuine education must be based on truth. 
The founders defined education as learning religion, morality, and knowledge. Education is, of course, only genuine if it teaches the truth. If it is based on lies, then it is not education but propaganda used to further the aims of those in power who control what is being taught. Where is truth found? Absolute goodness and truth is found in the Holy Bible, which states, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Gospel of John, chapter 17. Therefore, to repeat, they placed Christianity at the core of U.S. education. Tragically, since 1962, our educational elite have removed biblical morality from the public school curriculum. The legal reason for it was the establishment of the fraudulent separation of church and state doctrine corruptly adjudicated in the 1947 Supreme Court decision, Everson versus Board of Education. The fraud of the decision is clearly seen in that it was decided with no legal precedence nor any historical evidence and by the influence of the deeply anti-Christian American Civil Liberties Union. The Word of God, Revelation 12, 7. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. 19th century preacher Charles Spurgeon commented, Peace between good and evil is an impossibility. The consideration of it would mean the triumph of the powers of darkness. Michael will always fight. His holy soul detests sin, and he will not endure it. Jesus will always be the dragon's foe, not in a quiet sense, but actively, vigorously, and with full determination to exterminate evil. All his servants, whether angels in heaven or messengers on earth, will and must fight. They are born to be warriors. At the cross they enter into covenant never to make a truce with evil. The duty of every soldier in the army of the Lord is daily, and with all his heart, soul, and strength to fight against the dragon. The dragon and his angels will not decline the battle. They use every available weapon in their relentless onslaughts. We are foolish to expect to serve God without opposition. The more zealous we are, the more sure we are to be assailed by the forces of hell. The church may become slothful, but the restless spirit of her great antagonist never allows the war to pause. He hates the woman's seed and would gladly devour the church if he could. War rages all around, and to dream of peace is dangerous and futile. Glory be to God. We know the outcome of the war. The great dragon will be cast out and forever destroyed, while Jesus and they who are with him will receive the crown. Let us sharpen our sword and pray that the Holy Spirit will strengthen us for the conflict. What to do? What can you do? Okay, there's a couple of options. One, private school, Christian school. If you can afford it, put your children there. Secondly, homeschool, huge movement. As a matter of fact, you haven't heard on the news anything about homeschooling because they don't want to encourage people to homeschool because it's going like crazy. Everybody's homeschooling because they love their kids and they want the best for them. If you can't do homeschool and you can't afford to put them in Christian school, this is what you got to do. Every day they come home from school, you sit down with them and you go over everything that they've learned. Re-educate them, tell them the real truth, and then from the real truth, tell them why what they're being taught is wrong. And hopefully, you'll keep them in a Christian nation. In essence, the bottom line, if the righteous be in authority, sin will be punished and constrained. Religion and virtue will be supported and honored. But if the wicked get power in their hands, wickedness will abound. Religion, and in particular, Christian people will be persecuted.